The Adventures of Huckleberry. Get up! What you about? I opened my eyes and looked around, trying to make out where I was. It was after sun up, and I had been sound asleep. Pap was standing over me, looking sour and sick too. He says, "What you doing with his gun?" I judged he didn't know nothing about what he had been doing, so I says, "Somebody tried to get in, so I was laying for him." Why didn't you roust me out? Well, I tried to, but I couldn't. I couldn't budge you. Well, all right. Don't stand there palavering all day, but out with you and see if there's a fish on the lines for breakfast. I'll be along in a minute. He unlocked the door and I cleared out up the river bank. I noticed some pieces of limbs and such things floating down, and a sprinkling of bark. So I knowed the river had begun to rise. I reckoned I would have great times now if I was over at the town. The June rise used to be always luck for me, because as soon as that rise begins, here comes cordwood floating down and pieces of log rafts, sometimes a dozen logs together. So all you have to do is to catch them and sell them to the woodyards and the sawmill. I went along up the bank with one eye out for Pap and the other one out for what the rise might fetch along. Well, all at once here comes a canoe, just a beauty too, about thirteen or fourteen foot long, riding high like a duck. I shot head first off of the bank like a frog, clothes and all on, and struck out for the canoe. I just expected that be somebody laying down in it, because people often done that to fool folks, and when a chap had pulled a skiff out most to it, they'd raise up and laugh at him. But it weren't so this time. It was a drift canoe, sure enough, and I clumb in and paddled her ashore. Thinks I, the old man will be glad when he sees this. She's worth ten dollars. But when I got to shore, Pap wasn't in sight yet, and as I was running her into a little creek like a gully, all hung over with vines and willows, I struck another idea. I judged I'd hide her good, and then, instead of taking to the woods when I run off. I'd go down the river about fifty mile and camp in one place for good, and not have such a rough time tramping on foot. It was pretty close to the shanty, and I thought I heard the old man coming all the time, but I got her hid, and then I out and looked around a bunch of willows, and there was the old man down the path a piece, just drawing a bead on a bird with his gun, so he hadn't seen anything. When he got along, I was hard at it taking up a trot line. He abused me a little for being so slow, but I told him I fell in the river, and that was what made me so long. I knowed he would see I was wet, and then he would be asking questions. We got five catfish off the lines and went home. While we laid off after breakfast to sleep up, both of us being about wore out, I got to thinking that if I could fix up some way to keep Pap and the widow from trying to follow me. It would be a certainer thing than trusting to luck to get far enough off before they missed me. You see, all kinds of things might happen. Well, I didn't see no way for a while, but by and by, Pap raises up a minute to drink another barrel of water, and he says, "Another time a man comes prowling round here, you roust me out. You hear? That man wa'n't here for no good. I'd a shot him. Next time you roust me out, you hear?" Then he dropped down and went to sleep again. But what he had been saying gave me the very idea I wanted. I says to myself, "I can fix it now, so nobody won't think of following me." About twelve o'clock, we turned out and went along up the bank. The river was coming up pretty fast, and lots of driftwood going by on the rise. By and by, along comes part of a log raft, nine logs fast together. We went out with a skiff and towed it ashore. Then we had dinner. Anybody but Pap would have waited and seen the day through, so as to catch more stuff. But that warn't Pap's style. Nine logs was enough for one time. He must shove right over to town and sell. So he locked me in, took the skiff, and started off towing the raft about th half past three. I judged he wouldn't come back that night. I waited till I reckoned he had got a good start. Then I out with my saw and went to work on that log again. 
Before he was the other side of the river, I was out of the hole. Him and his raft were just a speck on the water, way off yonder. I took the sack of cornmeal and took it to where the canoe was hid, and shoved the vines and branches apart and put it in. Then I done the same with a side of bacon, then the whiskey jug. I took all the coffee and sugar there was, and all the ammunition. I took the wadding. I took the bucket and gourd. I took a dipper and a tin cup, and my old saw, and two blankets, and the skillet and the coffee pot. I took fish lines and matches and other things everything that was worth a cent. I cleaned out the place. I wanted an axe, but there wasn't any, only the one out at the woodpile, and I knowed why I was going to leave that. I fetched out the gun, and now I was done. I had wore the ground a good deal crawling out of the hole and dragging out so many things, so I fixed that as good as I could from the outside by scattering dust on the place, which covered up the smoothness and the sawdust. Then I fixed the piece of log back into its place, and put two rocks under it, and one against it to hold it there, for it was bent up at that place, and didn't quite touch ground. If you stood four or five feet away and didn't know it was sawed, you would not never notice it. And besides, this was the back of the cabin, and it weren't likely anybody would go fooling around there. It was all grass cleared to the canoe, so I hadn't left a track. I followed around to see. I stood on the bank and looked out over the river. All safe. So I took the gun and went up a piece into the woods, and was hunting around for some birds when I see a wild pig. Hogs soon went wild in them bottoms after they had got away from the prairie farms. I shot this fella and took him into camp. I took the axe and smashed in the door. I beat it and hacked it a considerable a doing it. I fetched the pig in and took him back nearly to the table, and hacked into his throat with the axe, and laid him down on the ground to bleed. I say ground because it was ground, hard packed, no boards. Well, next I took an old sack, and put a lot of big rocks in it, all I could drag, and I started it from the pig, and dragged it to the door, and through the woods down to the river, and dumped it in, and down it sunk out of sight. You could easy see that something had been dragged over the ground. I did wish Tom Sawyer was there. I knowed he would take an interest in this kind of business, and throw in the fancy touches. Nobody could spread himself like Tom Sawyer in such a thing as that. Well, last I pulled out some of my hair, and blooded the axe good, and stuck it on the back side, and slung the axe in the corner. Then I took up the pig and held him to my breast with my jacket, so he couldn't drip, till I got a good piece below the house, and then dumped him into the river. Now I thought of something else, so I went and got the bag of meal and my old saw out of the canoe, and fetched them to the house. I took the bag to where it used to stand, and ripped a hole in the bottom of it with the saw, for there weren't no knives and forks on the place papped on everything with his clasp knife about the cooking. Then I carried the sack about a hundred yards across the grass and through the willows east of the house, to a shallow lake that was five mile wide and full of rushes, and ducks too, you might say, in the season. There was a slough or a creek leading out of it on the other side that went miles away, I don't know where, but it didn't go to the river. The meal sifted out and made a little track all the way to the lake. I dropped Pap's whetstone there, too, so as to look like it had been done by accident. Then I tied up the rip in the meal sack with a string so it wouldn't leak no more, and took it and my saw to the canoe again. It was about dark now, so I dropped the canoe down the river under some willows that hung over the bank, and waited for the moon to rise. I made fast to a willow, then I took a bite to eat and by and by laid down in the canoe to smoke a pipe and lay out a plan. I says to myself, they'll follow the track of that sack full of rocks to the shore, and then drag the river for me. And they'll follow that meal track to the lake, and go browsing down the creek that leads out of it to find the robbers that killed me and took the things. They won't ever hunt the river for anything but my dead carcass. They'll soon get tired of that, and won't bother no more about me. All right, 
I can stop anywhere I want to. Jackson's Island is good enough for me. I know that island pretty well, and nobody ever comes there. And then I can paddle over to town nights and slink around and pick up things I want. Jackson Island's the place. I was pretty tired, and the first thing I knowed I was asleep. When I woke up, I didn't know where I was for a minute. I sat up and looked around a little scared. Then I remembered. The river looked miles and miles across. The moon was so bright I could have counted the drift logs that went a slipping along, black and still, hundreds of yards out from shore. Everything was dead quiet, and it looked late, and smelt late. You know what I mean. I don't know the words to put it in. I took a good gap and a stretch, and was just going to unhitch and start, when I heard a sound away over the water. I listened. Pretty soon I made it out. It was that dull kind of a regular sound that comes from oars working in rowlocks when it's a still night. I peeped out through the willow branches, and there it was, a skiff, away across the water. I couldn't tell how many was in it. It kept a coming, and when it was abreast of me, I see there weren't but one man in it. Thinks I, maybe it's Pap, though I weren't expecting him. He dropped below me with the current, and by and by he come a-swinging up shore in the easy water, and he went by so close I could have reached out the gun and touched him. Well, it was Pap, sure enough, and sober, too, by the way he laid his oars. I didn't lose no time. The next minute I was a-spinning downstream, soft but quick, in the shade of the bank. I made two mile and a half, and then struck out a quarter of a mile or more towards the middle of the river, because pretty soon I would be passing the ferry landing, and people might see me and hail me. I got out amongst the driftwood, and then laid down in the bottom of the canoe, and let her float. I laid there, and had a good rest and a smoke out of my pipe looking away into the sky, not a cloud in it. The sky looks ever so deep when you lay down on your back in the moonshine. I never knowed it before. And how far a body can hear on the water such nights! I heard people talking at the ferry landing. I heard what they said, too, every word of it. One man said it was getting towards the long days and the short nights now. T'other one said this warn't one of the short ones, he reckoned. And then they laughed, and he said it over again, and they laughed again. Then they waked up another fellow and told him, and laughed. But he didn't laugh. He ripped out something brisk, and said let him alone. The first fellow said he loud to tell it to his old woman. She would think it was pretty good. But he said that warn't nothing to some things he had said in his time. I heard one man say it was nearly three o'clock and he hoped daylight wouldn't wait more than about a week longer. After that the talk got further and further away, and I couldn't make out the words any more. But I could hear the mumble, and now and then a laugh, too, but it seemed a long ways off. I was away below the ferry now. I rose up, and there was Jackson's Island, about two mile and a half downstream, heavy timbered and standing up out of the middle of the river big and dark and solid, like a steamboat without any lights. There weren't any signs of the bar at the head. It was all under water now. It didn't take me long to get there. I shot past the head at a ripping rate. The current was so swift. And then I got into the dead water and landed on the side towards the Illinois shore. I run the canoe into a deep dent in the bank that I knowed about. I had to part the willow branches to get in and when I made fast nobody could have seen the canoe from the outside. I went up and sat down on a log at the head of the island, and looked out on the big river and the black driftwood and away over to the town, three mile away, where there was three or four lights a-twinkling. A monstrous big lumber raft was about a mile upstream, coming along down, with a lantern in the middle of it. I watched it come creeping down, and when it was most abreast of where I stood, I heard a man say, "'Stern oars there! Heave her head to stabbard. I heard that just as plain as if the man was by my side. 
There was a little gray in the sky now, so I stepped into the woods and laid down for a nap before breakfast. End of chapter. Chapter 8 The sun was up so high when I waked that I judged it was after eight o'clock. I laid there in the grass in the cool shade, thinking about things, and feeling rested and rather comfortable and satisfied. I could see the sun out at one or two holes, but mostly it was big trees all about, and gloomy in there amongst them. There were freckled places on the shore where the light sifted down through the leaves, and the freckled places swapped about a little, showing there was a little breeze up there. A couple of squirrels sat on a limb and jabbered at me very friendly. I was powerful lazy and comfortable, didn't want to get up and cook breakfast. Well. I was dozing off again when I thinks I hear a deep sound of boom away up the river. I rouses up, rests on my elbow, and listens. Pretty soon I hears it again. I hopped up and went and looked out at a hole in the leaves, and I see a bunch of smoke laying on the water a long ways up, about abreast the ferry. And there was the ferry boat full of people floating along down. I knowed what was the matter now. Boom! I see the white smoke squirt out of the ferryboat's side. You see, they was firing cannon over the water, trying to make my carcass come to the top. I was pretty hungry, but it warn't going to do for me to start a fire, because they might see the smoke. So I sat there and watched the cannon smoke, and listened to the boom. The river was a mile wide there, and it always looks pretty on a summer morning so I was having a good enough time seeing them hunt for my remainders if I only had a bite to eat. Well, then I happened to think how they always put quicksilver in loaves of bread and float them off, because they always go right to the drowned carcass and stop there. So, says I, I'll keep a lookout, and if any of them's floating around after me I'll give them a show. I changed to the Illinois edge of the island to see what luck I could have. I warn't disappointed. A big double loaf come along, and I most got it with a long stick, but my foot slipped, and she floated out further. Of course I was where the current set in the closest to the shore. I knowed enough for that. But by and by along comes another one, and this time I won. I took out the plug, and shook out the little dab of quicksilver, and set my teeth in. It was baker's bread, what the quality eat. None of your low-down corn pone. I got a good place amongst the leaves, and sat there on a log, munching the bread and watching the ferry boat, and very well satisfied. And then something struck me. I says, now I reckon the widow or the parson or somebody prayed that this bread would find me, and here it is gone and done it. So there ain't no doubt but there is something in that thing. That is, there's something in it when a body like the widow or the parson prays, but it don't work for me, and I reckon it don't work for only just the right kind. I lit a pipe and had a good long smoke, and went on watching. The ferry boat was floating with the current, and I allowed I'd have a chance to see who was aboard when she came along, because she would come in close, where the bread did. When she got pretty well along down towards me, I put out my pipe and went to where I fished out the bread, and lay down behind a log on the bank in a little open place, where the log forked I could peep through. By and by she come along, and she drifted in so close that they could a run out a plank and walked ashore. Most everybody was on the boat, Pap and Judge Thatcher and Bessie Thatcher, and Joe Harper and Tom Sawyer and his old Aunt Polly and Sid and Mary, and plenty more. Everybody was talking about the murder, but the captain broke in and says, Look sharp now. The current sets in the closest here, and maybe he's washed ashore and got tangled amongst the brush at the water's edge. I hope so, anyway. I didn't hope so. They all crowded up and leaned over the rails, nearly in my face, and kept still, watching with all their might. I could see them first rate, but they couldn't see me. Then the captain sung out, "'Stand away!' 
and the cannon left off such a blast right before me that it made me deef with the noise and pretty near blind with the smoke, and I judged I was gone. If they'd a had some bullets in, I reckon they'd a got the corpse they was after. Well, I see I warn't hurt, thanks to goodness. The boat floated on and went out of sight around the shoulder of the island. I could hear the booming now and then, further and further off, and by and by, after an hour, I didn't hear it no more. The island was three mile long. I judged they had got to the foot and was giving it up. But they didn't yet a while. They turned around the foot of the island and started up the channel on the Missouri side, under steam, and booming once in a while as they went. I crossed over to that side and watched them. When they got abreast the head of the island they quit shooting, and dropped over to the Missouri shore, and went home to the town. I knowed I was all right now. Nobody else would come a-hunting after me. I got my traps out of the canoe, and made me a nice camp in the thick woods. I made a kind of a tent out of my blankets to put my things under so the rain couldn't get at em. I catched a catfish, and haggled him open with my saw, and towards sundown I started my campfire and had supper. Then I set out a line to catch some fish for breakfast. When it was dark I sat by my campfire smoking, and feeling pretty well satisfied. But by and by it got sort of lonesome, and so I went and sat on the bank and listened to the current swashing along, and counted the stars and drift logs and rafts that come down, and then went to bed. There ain't no better way to put in time when you are lonesome. You can't stay so, you soon get over it. And so for three days and nights. No difference, just the same thing. But the next day I went exploring around down through the island. I was boss of it. It all belonged to me, so to say, and I wanted to know all about it. But mainly I wanted to put in the time. I found plenty strawberries, ripe and prime, and green summer grapes, and green raspberries, and the green blackberries was just beginning to show. They would all come handy by and by, I judged. Well, I went fooling along in the deep woods till I judged I warn't far from the foot of the island. I had my gun along, but I hadn't shot nothing. It was for protection. I thought I would kill some game nigh home. About this time I mighty near stepped on a good-sized snake, and it went sliding off through the grass and flowers, and I after it, trying to get a shot at it. I clipped along, and all of a sudden I bounded right on to the ashes of a campfire that was still smoking. My heart jumped up amongst my lungs. I never waited for to look further, but uncocked my gun and went sneaking back on my tiptoes as fast as ever I could. Every now and then I stopped a second amongst the thick leaves and listened, but my breath come so hard I couldn't hear nothing else. I slunk along another piece further, then listened again, and so on, and so on. If I see a stump, I took it for a man. If I trod on a stick and broke it, it made me feel like a person had cut one of my breaths in two, and I only got half, and the short half, too. When I got to camp I warn't feeling very brash. There warn't much sand in my crawl. But I says, this ain't no time to be fooling around. So I got all my traps into my canoe again, so as to have them out of sight. And I put out the fire scattered the ashes around to look like an old last year's camp, and then clumb a tree. I reckon I was up in the tree two hours, but I didn't see nothing, I didn't hear nothing, I only thought I heard and seen as much as a thousand things. Well, I couldn't stay up there forever, so at last I got down, but I kept in the thick woods and on the lookout all the time. All I could get to eat was berries and what was left over from breakfast. By the time it was night I was pretty hungry, so when it was good and dark I slid out from shore before moonrise and paddled over to the Illinois bank, about a quarter of a mile. I went out in the woods and cooked a supper, and had about made up my mind I would stay there all night, when I hear a plunkety-plunk, plunkety-plunk, and says to myself, horses coming, 
and next I hear people's voices. I got everything into my canoe as quick as I could, and then went creeping through the woods to see what I could find out. I hadn't got far when I hear a man say, "'We better camp here if we can find a good place. The horses is about beat out. Let's look around.' I didn't wait, but shoved out and paddled away easy. I tied up in the old place, and reckoned I would sleep in the canoe. I didn't sleep much. I couldn't, somehow, for thinking. And every time I waked up I thought somebody had me by the neck. So the sleep didn't do me no good. By and by I says to myself, I can't live this way. I'm a-going to find out who it is that's here on the island with me. I'll find it out or bust. Well, I felt better right off. So I took my paddle and slid out from shore just a step or two, and then let the canoe drop along down amongst the shadows. The moon was shining, and outside of the shadows it made it most as light as day. I poked along well on to an hour, everything still as rocks and sound as sleep. Well, by this time I was most down to the foot of the island. A little ripply, cool breeze begun to blow, and that was as good as saying the night was about done. I give her a turn with a paddle and brung her nose to shore, then I got my gun and slipped out and into the edge of the woods. I sat down there on a the log and looked out through the leaves. I see the moon go off watch, and the darkness begin to blanket the river. But in a little while I see a pale streak over the treetops and knowed the day was coming. So I took my gun and slipped off towards where I had run across that campfire, stopping every minute or two to listen. But I hadn't no luck somehow. I couldn't seem to find the place. But by and by, sure enough, I catched a glimpse of fire away through the trees. I went for it, cautious and slow. By and by I was close enough to have a look, and there laid a man on the ground. It most give me the fantots. He had a blanket round his head, and his head was nearly in the fire. I sat there behind a clump of bushes in about six foot of him, and kept my eyes on him steady. It was getting gray daylight now. Pretty soon he gapped and stretched himself, and hove off the blanket, and it was Miss Watson's Jim. I bet I was glad to see him. I says, Hello, Jim, and skipped out. He bounced up and stared at me wild. Then he drops down on his knees and puts his hands together and says, Don't hurt me, don't. I ain't never done no harm to a ghost. I always liked dead people and done all I could for em. You go and get in the river again where you belongs, and don't do nothing to old Jim Adder's always your friend. Well, I warn't long making him understand I warn't dead. I was ever so glad to see Jim. I warn't lonesome now. I told him I warn't afraid of him telling the people where I was. I talked along, but he only sat there and looked at me, never said nothing. Then I says, It's good daylight. Let's get breakfast. Make up your campfire good. What's the use of making up the campfire to cook strawberries and such truck? But you've got a gun, hain't you? Then we can get some from better than strawberries. Strawberries and such truck, I says. Is that what you live on? I couldn't get nothing else, he says. Why, how long you been on the island, Jim? I come here the night after you was killed. What, all that time? Yes, indeedy. And ain't you had nothing but that kind of rubbish to eat? No, sir, nothing else. Well, you must be most starved, ain't you? I reckon I could eat a hoss. I think I could. How long you been on the island? Since the night I got killed. No. Why, what has you lived on? But you, you got a gun. Oh, yeah, you got a gun. That's good. Now you kill something and I'll make up the fire. So we went over to where the canoe was, and while he built a fire in a grassy open place amongst the trees, I fetched meal and bacon and coffee, and coffee pot and frying pan, and sugar, and tin cups, and the nigger was set back considerable, 
because he reckoned it was all done with witchcraft. I catched a good big catfish, too, and Jim cleaned him with his knife and fried him. When breakfast was ready we lolled on the grass and eat it smoking hot. Jim laid it in with all his might, for he was most about starved. Then when we got pretty well stuffed, we laid off and lazied. By and by Jim says, "'But looky here, Huck. Who was it dat was killed in dat shanty if it weren't you?' Then I told him the whole thing, and he said it was smart. He said Tom Sawyer couldn't get up no better plan than what I had. Then I says, "'How do you come to be here, Jim? How'd you get here?' He looked pretty uneasy, didn't say nothing for a minute. Then he says, "'Maybe I better not tell.' "'Why, Jim?' "'Well, there's reasons. But you wouldn't tell on me if I'd as tell you, would you, Huck?' "'Blamed if I would, Jim.' "'Well, I believe you, Huck. I—I I run off.' "'Jim!' "'But mind, you said you wouldn't tell. You know you said you wouldn't tell, Huck.' "'Well, I did. I said I wouldn't, and I'll stick to it. Honest, Injun, I will.' People would call me a low-down abolitionist and despise me for keeping mum, but that don't make no difference. I ain't a-going to tell, and I ain't a-going back there anyways. So now, let's know all about it. Well, you see, it is this way. Old missus, that's Miss Watson, she pecks on me all the time, and treats me pooty rough, but she always said she wouldn't sell me down to Orleans. But I noticed there was a nigger trader round the place considerable lately, and I begin to get on easy. Well, one night I creeps to the pooty late, and the door wa'n't quite shut, and I hear old missus tell the widder she gwine sell me down to Orleans. But she didn't want to, but she could get eight hundred dollars for me, and it is such a big stack of money she couldn't resist. The widow, she tried to get her to say she wouldn't do it, but I never waited to hear the rest. I lit out mighty quick, I tell you. I took out and shinned down the hill, and specked a steel a skift along the shore some was above the town. But there was people a-stirring yet, so I hid in the old tumble-down cooper shop on the bank to wait for everybody to go away. Well, I was there all night. They was somebody round all the time. Long about six in the morning, skiffs begin to go by, and about eight or nine, every skiff that went long was talking about how your pap come over to the town to say you's killed. These last skiffs was full of ladies and gentlemen a going over for to see the place. Sometimes they pull up at the shore and take a rest before they started across. So by the talk, I got to know all about the killing. I was powerful saw you was killed, Huck, but I ain't no more now. I laid there under the shavings all day. I was hungry, but I want not fear it, cause I know old missus and the widow was going to start to the camp meeting right after breakfast and be gone all day, and they knows I goes off with the cattle about daylight, so they wouldn't expect to see me round the place, and so they wouldn't miss me till after dark in the evening. The other servants wouldn't miss me, cause they'd shin out and take holiday soon as the old folks was out of the way. Well, when it come dark, I took out up the river road, and went about two mile or more to where there want no houses. I made up my mind about what I was going to do. You see, if I kept on trying to get away afoot, the dogs would track me. If I stole a skiff to cross over. They'd missed that skip, you see, and they'd know about where I land on the other side, and where to pick up my track. So I says, a raft is what I's after. It don't make no track. I see a light a coming round the point by and by, and I wade in and shove a log ahead of me and swum more than half way across the river, and got in amongst the driftwood, and kept my head down low, and kind of swum again the current till the raft come along. Then I swum to the stern of it and took a holt. It clouded up and was pretty dark for a little while. 
so I plumb up and laid down on the planks. De men is all way yonder in the middle where the lantern was. De river was a rising, and dey was a good current, and I reckon that by four in the morning I'd be twenty-five mile down the river, and den I'd slip in just for daylight and swim ashore, and take to the woods on the Illinois side. But I didn't have no luck. When we is most down to the head of the island, a man begins to come aft with the lantern, and I see it want no use for to wait, so I slid overboard and struck out for the island. Well, I had a notion I could land most anywheres, but I couldn't bank too bluff, and I was most at the foot of the island before I found a good place. I went into the woods, and judged I wouldn't fool with rafts no more, long as they moved the lantern round so. I had my pipe and a plug of dog leg, and some matches in my cap, and they warn't wet, so I was all right. "'And so you ain't had no meat nor bread to eat all this time? Why didn't you get mud-turkles?' "'How you going to get em? You can't slip up on em and grab em. And how's a body going to get em with a rock? How could a body do it in the night? And I weren't going to show myself on the bank in the daytime.' "'Well, that's so. You've had to keep in the woods all the time, of course. Did you hear em shooting the cannon?' "'Oh, yes.' I know day was after you. I see em go by here. Watched em through the bushes. Some young birds come along, flying a yard or two at a time and lighting. Jim said it was a sign it was going to rain. He said it was a sign when young chickens flew that way, and so we reckoned it was the same way when young birds done it. I was going to catch some of them, but Jim wouldn't let me. He said it was death. He said his father laid mighty sick once, and some of them catched a bird, and his old granny said his father would die, and he did. And Jim said you mustn't count the things you are going to cook for dinner, because that would bring bad luck. The same if you shook the tablecloth after sundown. And he said that if a man owned a beehive, and that man died, the bees must be told about it before sun-up next morning or else the bees would all weaken down and quit work and die. Jim said bees wouldn't sting idiots, but I didn't believe that, because I had tried them lots of times myself, and they wouldn't sting me. I had heard about some of these things before, but not all of them. Jim knowed all kinds of signs. He said he knowed most everything. I said it looked to me like all the signs was about bad luck and so I asked him if there weren't any good luck signs. He says, Mighty few, and they ain't no use to a body. What you want to know when good luck's a-comin' for? Want to keep it off? And he said, If you's got hairy arms and a hairy breast, it's a sign that you's a goin' to be rich. Well, there's some use in a sign like that, cause it's so fur ahead. You see, maybe you's got to be poor a long time first, and so you might get discouraged and kill yourself if you didn't know by the sign that you going to be rich by and by. Have you got hairy arms and a hairy breast, Jim? What's to use to ask that question? Don't you see I has? Well, are you rich? No, but I've been rich once, and going to be rich again. Once I had fourteen dollars, but I took to speculating and got busted out. What did you speculate in, Jim? Well, first I tackled stock. What kind of stock? Why, livestock, cattle, you know. I put ten dollars in a cow. But I ain't going to risk no more money in stock. The cow up and died on my hands. So you lost the ten dollars? No, I didn't lose it all. I only lost about nine of it. I sold a hide and taller for a dollar and ten cents. You had five dollars and ten cents left. Did you speculate any more? Yes. You know that one-legged nigger that belongs to old Mr. Bradish? Well, he sought up a bank, and say anybody that put in a dollar would get four dollars more at the end of the year. Well, all the niggers went in, but they didn't have much. I was the only one that had much. So I stuck out for more than four dollars, and I said if I didn't get it, I'd start a bank myself. Well, of 
course dat nigger want to keep me out of de business, because he says dey want business enough for two banks. So he say I could put in my five dollars, and he pay me thirty-five at the end of the year. So I done it. Then I reckon I'd invest the thirty-five dollars right off and keep things a-movin'. There was a nigger named Bob that had catched a wood flat, and his master didn't know it and I bought it off'n him, and told him to take the thirty-five dollars when the end of the year come. But somebody stole the wood flat that night, and next day the one-legged nigger say the bank's busted. So they didn't none of us get no money. What did you do with the ten cents, Jim? Well, I was going to spend it, but I had a dream, and the dream told me to give it to a nigger named Balaam. Balaam's ass, they call him for short. He's one of them chuckleheads, you know. But he's lucky, they say, and I see I weren't lucky. The dream say let Balaam invest the ten cents, and he'd make a raise for me. Well, Balaam, he took the money, and when he was in church, he hear the preacher say that whoever give to the poor lent to the Lord, and bound to get his money back a hundred times. So Balaam he took and give the ten cents to the poor, and laid low to see what was going to come of it. Well, what did come of it, Jim? Nothing never come of it. I couldn't manage to collect that money, no way. And Balaam he couldn't. I ain't going to lend no more money, doubt I see the security. Bound to get your money back a hundred times, the preacher says. If I could get the ten cents back, I'd call it square and be glad of the chance. Well, it's all right anyway, Jim, long as you're going to be rich again some time or other. Yes, and I's rich now, come to look at it. I owns myself, and I's worth eight hundred dollars. I wished I had the money. I wouldn't want no more. End of chapter.